We live in the world our questions create, says today's guest. It's easy to believe that we live in a world that's falling apart. After all, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that's true. But if we look a little deeper, if we look behind the headlines, there's another world quietly coming into being. My guest this episode has played an important role in helping leaders around the world imagine and make manifest a new and positive future. David Cooperider is the Fairmont Minerals Chair and Professor of Social Entrepreneurship at the Weatherhead School of Management at Case Western Reserve University. He's also Faculty Director at the Center for Business as an Agent of World Benefit. He is organizer of the upcoming Global Summit, the Great Leadership Reset, which will bring together business leaders who are actively bringing a more just and sustainable world into existence. I'm also giving a really great talk there as well. It's likely the most exciting business conference of its kind. Registration for the summit is entirely free, and I'll put information about it in the show notes. We live in the world our questions create. What are the questions you are asking yourself? Well, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> it's really great to talk to the legendary David Cooperwriter. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me and, um, and sharing. And I really enjoyed our conversation um, a couple of weeks ago, the recording we did for the fifth global forum for business as an agent of world benefit. You were um, a gift and I thank you for that. Well, that's, it's my pleasure. And uh, I'm really, and we'll talk about the global forum because that's a really important event that's coming up and the world needs to know about that. Um, but first I was wondering, you know, I think when people hear the name David Cooper Ryder, they associate that with appreciative inquiry, which is, I think, an aspect of your work that, uh, is, I think, a cornerstone of the work you do. And I was wondering if you might be willing to talk about what, what appreciative inquiry is and, and how did you start it and what, what effect do you want it to have in the world? Right, right. Yeah, no, great question. And I think, um, you know, I think I, there were seeds of the development of appreciative inquiry. Um, when I look back, um, I think it, it started to germinate when I was in college. And, um, you know, and it was a time in the 60s and so on um, where lots and lots of challenges, not like, unlike today, um, and a lot of activism breaking out and so on. And um, I, was, um, I was fortunate to um, get a college scholarship to go to Japan. And it was, um, it was life-changing. It was, you know, I was, I was, it was the first time I'd ever been on a plane. Um, and, and I was studying in the social sciences um, and really un trying to understand groups and cultures and so on. But this really came home to me. Um, and on that trip, it was a gift, but it was a hard, hard lesson, I think, or uh, an emotional moment. Um, the first day I, we, we went to Hiroshima. And um, at that moment, I felt, um, I felt, uh, um, you know, I mean, with the, I, a question was born for me, and I began to say, what are we going to discover in the human sciences and the social sciences um, that's as powerful in a positive relationship sense as the atomic bomb is in a negative relationship sense? What are we going to discover? And, um, and it, you know, it was like an atomic bomb of awareness went off in my heart and I felt the, um, you know, the, the power that's in our human hands. And um, so that question was important to me. And I think I've been in search of that and what are we gonna discover that's as powerful in a positive human sense um, for a long time. So I was fortunate and, um, able to go and get my PhD and study with Suresh Ravaspa, um, the chairman of what it was at that time, you know, just an amazing PhD program in organizational behavior, ranked number one in the world. I was just very fortunate to be with those faculty. Um, 
And the appreciative inquiry, you know, I was steeped in organization development and the field of organization development was very diagnostic in its approaches. Um, you know, and I, um, I never felt right about that, you know, and um, I, then I was asked to do an analysis, um, a diagnosis of the, one of the biggest healthcare systems in the world, the Cleveland Clinic. And um, of course, I, you know, in those days, like I studied, you know, um, with Harry Levinson, the book called Organizational Diagnosis. And the, you know, the questions all started with, you know, what are the things in your work that are causing you the most stress? And what are the biggest barriers to getting um, things done in this organization and so on? And, and that's the way I started it. But when I got into that system, um, it was a, a incredible, um, management system and totally unique. Um, it had had a revolution and a few years earlier um, the, the, you had the typical hierarchical model, the medical hierarchy, the administrative hierarchy, but they overthrew that. The doctors all came together and said this bureaucracy is choking us. And so they developed a whole new kind of leadership where physicians and administrators are in each other shoes, you know, there would be a head of finance that was an administrator and a head of finance that would be a, head, a doctor. And it was collaborative and they were making decisions in groups of 500 or a thousand people. And it was, um, and so I went to the chairman of the board at that time, Dr. Bill Kaiser, and I said, you have something special going on here in the whole concept of a group and um, a holistic way of management. And at that time, it was very radical, um, that de democracy and so on. And, and so I went to my chairman, I said, I don't wanna do a diagnosis of this system. I wanna study everything that's giving life and birth to this embryonic innovation, this um, social invention. And, um, and so um, I went and I talked to the chairman of the board and I, I said the same thing. And so that's what I started doing. And I, you know, had the privilege of interviewing, you know, hundreds of people and leaders in every area of medicine. And, um, and it was just such an inspiration. And while, you know, I, during that time, then I just began to look at the true, the good, the better, the possible, everything that's giving life to this system when it's most alive. And, um, you know, when collaboration was beyond, when patient care and the human touch was um, um, most, most observable, when the spirit of the organization was translated into collaborative innovations and so on. And so I just, all I did was put everything else aside, you know, all the problematic patterns, all the difficulties, because part of it was, you know, this democratic form was messy, um, terribly messy. And that's why the um, chairman of the board wanted me to do a diagnosis. But what I began to study, I said, we will not understand this social invention unless we search for the true, the good, the better, the possible, everything that gives life. And I wrote a 50 page report on this and had a chance to present it to the board of governors. And the first thing, a lot of the board uh, were medical professionals and they just started with the you know medical model. They said, well, wait a second, wait a second. Where in this 57 pages, where's all our problems? Um, what's your diagnosis of our system? And in that, I had a footnote. I said, I said, you can see this footnote in this report. And, um, and we called it appreciative inquiry. It was, you know, it was kind of a throwaway concept at that time. And, um, you know, it was just a, 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 you know, actually it wasn't just a throwaway concept, but it was just a footnote. And I described that my method was to study everything that gave life and the true, the good, the better, the possible, all the exceptions to the rule, not the averages, and, um, and then piece together a prospective image of what's possible for this system, a prospective theory of the ideal organization. Well, what was surprising is that 
they just, as, as I explained the method, they just got so into it and the discussion was so deep and we couldn't turn off the conversation at the board level. And they said, can we do this same kind of thing with all 8,000 people? And, um, and so, um, so that became the, the, the basis of a next couple years piece of work where I began to study how inquiry itself changes the phenomena, like the Heisenberg effect, but on steroids, you know, in human systems. We know that in the new physics and quantum understandings, how just the sheer observation of, of the particles shifts and changes the phenomena itself. And, you know, to some extent, you know, in everything we study, but, you know, in, I can study the orbits of the moon and so on, and it's not going to change it much. But in human systems, the minute you ask a question, um, the orbits of attention begin to shift, the Im images, the, the worlds. And so some principles were born around this appreciative inquiry. I studied time one, time two, time three. And every time we studied through an appreciative lens, and lifted up um, the what I will call now the positive core of the system, all past, present, and future capacity. Every time we did that, the movement in statistical terms, they got closer and closer to the ideals that they all held as an organization. So there was no intervention except inquiry. And so um, I, I think there's some principles that emerged here that um, that are important that um, and one of them I'll call the constructionist principle that we live in worlds that our questions create, that the questions we ask um, in a sense determine what we find and what we find sets the stage for how we dialogue with one another and, and the, the substance of the imagination that can flow. And so the second principle is you know very often we think of organizational analysis as you know point A and then some change as point B as separate moments, but um, it became clear that inquiry and change are not separate at all. There, it's a simultaneous moment, and um, and so inquiry and change are interchangeable. We don't even need to be talking about intervention. Inquiry does cause that intervention. And then the third principle was the poetic principle that organizations aren't so much like machines in today's postmodern and creative world. It's, it depends on, you know, it's, they're more like an open book. It depends on who's doing the reading. We all see the same thing from a different perspective, the accountant, the doctor, and so on. And, um, and so what that means is that we can study, I, I call it the poetic principle because like it's a like organizations are like a good piece of poetry. We can dip into their history and their moments and their possibilities like we read a good piece of poetry. We can gain new insight, new inspiration with every reading. And it also means that we can study anything in any human organization that we want. You know, it means it's an open book. We could study alienation and anger and separation and bitterness in every human system. We can study also moments of incredible inspiration, hope and joy in every system. We can study breakdown between divisions and departments and silos and so on. But we could also study improbable collaborations that, had, that nobody would have expected. What do they look like and so on. So, um, and then the last principle was the anticipatory principle that human systems are constantly projecting ahead of themselves a preview, a film clip, a video of what their thoughts are about the future. And those images work backwards on us and cause the action in the present. And so, um, so what we found was appreciative inquiry as, form, as a kind of prospective imagination um, was also part of the explanation of why it was so powerful. Um, so anyway, that's abstract and, um, and that's, that's kind of the conceptual basis. But the last principle was the positive principle and, um, and that's not so abstract. Um, what I found was the more 
powerfully positive the question I asked, the more powerful the learning and the change process would be. Um, that somehow there was a relationship between the questions that search for the true, the good, the better, the possible, and the positive human energy that would develop, you know, like Barbara Fredrickson's theories of what good is positive emotion, like hope and inspiration and joy. And she's found that it's incredibly powerful in terms of bringing us together in pro-social relationships, in terms of innovation and creativity and so on. So anyway, um, that, that was kind of the beginning of the appreciative inquiry approach. So you <clears throat> were cast into this system to study its dysfunction and <laughs> realized you could put your attention somewhere else on what was working. And that, well, and, that, and that a totally different picture would emerge than had you done otherwise. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and to adopt the mindset of almost, um, you know, like a reverence for life. Um, you know, like if we look at, um, you know, most organizations, if, if I ask, you know, um, if I ask them, if, if, if I ask leaders to, here's a case study on General Motors, um, read the case study at lunch and, and come back with a spokesperson. Um, and you can try this because I've done it over and over and over again. And 98% of the time when I ask them to look at this General Motors case study, 10 pages and come back with their organizational analysis, I don't tell them how to do the analysis, but they come back and the first spokesperson has a flip chart and they said, wow, we had an interesting, really fascinating discussion at lunch as a team looking at this case of General Motors. And, you know, here's the biggest problem we saw, saw in it at General Motors. And the flip chart lists that. And, and I'm saying, interesting, I didn't ask for a problem analysis, but, and then they say, then we went the next step deeper and began to um, you know, we wanted to stay, you know, the problem at General Motors was that senior leadership had touched, lost touch with where the commercial markets are going, and customers and the innovation field and so on. And, and, and then they flipped the flip chart and, but we just wanted to understand the causes of that. And so we looked at the root causes of what the problems were. And here's the basic problems we saw, too much hierarchy, not enough investment in research and development and innovation and so on. Anyway, and then they'd say, finally, at the end, um, if we were the managers there or consultant team, what would the intervention be? What would the treatment be? How would we solve this problem? And um, what was interesting to me is after doing that with lots and lots of groups, you know, and they all come back with that same pattern. And it was almost as if we in the industrial age had developed like a a core image of what institutional life is and organizational life. And um, it was almost like the root metaphor was the world is a problem to be solved. If organizations and the world is a problem to be solved, um, well, then it makes a lot of sense. You know, um, my job as a manager is to solve the biggest problem of the day. My job as a consultant is to um, help the system um, deal with the biggest problems coming its way. And so everything kind of got cast into that kind of framework. And what we said is, wait a second, just at a deeper level, organizations aren't problems to be solved. That's not what they are. Yeah, they might have some problems, but that's not what their identity is. What if we put on the root metaphor that organizations are like miracles of human interaction and relationships and centers of relationships that bring people together with infinite imaginative capacity and infinite capacity to interrelate and connect strengths and so on. And so we began to say, if we enter a new organization with a different metaphor that we don't know what gives life to living human systems when they're most alive, this miracle of life on this planet, and, um, and so that kind of rigorous, you, you shift your whole questions, you know, instead of doing one more low morale survey to document the low morale among the nurses, 
you start saying, what gives life to this system when people are beyond their job descriptions, when the life and flourishing is happening? And so that's the exciting shift, I think, that begins to happen as opposed to a, a mechanic trying to fix the car engine under the hood, we become, you know, students of life, life giving, what's giving life to this system? And that's a mystery and that's a powerful question. And it requires a lot of depth understanding, you know, whenever you go into a new organization. And so what, ha what kind of changes emerge as a result of that? Yeah, of yeah. Shift in, in, the, in the shift in moving from problem and dysfunction to life giving and life creating. Yeah, well, all of a sudden people begin to, you know, once you begin to see what's giving life to living systems and these stories begin to spread across every part of the organization, um, all of a sudden that discovery leads to imagination. Well, if that one unit could do it, you know, we could possibly do that. And so it leads to um, the process of imagination. The other is that it recognizes the goodness and the, uh, the deep goodness of, of people in the system. And so the exciting part on an applied sense is as we began experimenting with appreciative inquiry, it's, you know, let's say we did it with an executive team of, you know, C-suite group of 18 people they'd start seeing their relationships would come together in such a powerful way, the admiration of each other, the respect, the, um, the sense of hope about what we're capable of as you fill the room with the stories that aren't utopia, they're real, they're, they're there every day um, for the taking, the stories of revolutionary moments of customer um, responsiveness, for example. And so, um, so then they say, my gosh, we have such good stuff going on. Why don't we bring, you know, 50 people together to do this work? Why don't we bring 100? Why don't we bring 200? And that, that's uh, been, you know, the, uh, there's some logic to why that happens in terms of relationships. Um, and that, that's very powerful, but that's given birth to the second part of appreciative inquiry. There's lots of tools like the art of the question. We have books on, you know, three or four books on the art of the question, the encyclopedia of positive questions, questions that leaders can ask to surface the true, the good, the better, the possible, the exceptions to the rule. Um, so there's lots of tools, but the one tool that is um, truly um, exciting for me and raises my sense of hope every time I'm part of it, it's called the Appreciative Inquiry Summit. And progressively, we were asked, you know, okay, you know, let's bring together 64 people now to do the strategy work and the design work for the future. Um, and no, now let's, let's go to 80 people. Let's go to 100 people. Let's go to, and one of the things that we discovered is every time we had a more complete wholeness to the system, you know, if I was working with a, uh, a trucking company, we'd bring together the dock workers, the truck drivers, the CEO, the CFO, we bring together external stakeholders, the customers, um, we bring together other companies that they could learn from. And pretty soon we were doing summits like this three day interactive planning summits, not talking heads, not pre negotiated agreements, not you know, uh, but coming together in collaborative, um, appreciative inquiry planning and designing for three or four days. And my sense of hope just began to surge about what we're capable of as human beings. It doesn't take much to create um, conditions where adults, where all adults can come together and, um, and work together to create that future. So the Appreciative Inquiry Summit, we're doing summits now, you know, anywhere between 500 people, that's kind of the average, to 1,000 um, now with Zoom and other technologies, 2,000, 2,500. And there, the discovery was, we knew the power of appreciation, you know, relationships come alive where there's an appreciative eye, where people see the best and the true and the good in each other. 
We knew inquiry was powerful. The way we craft questions, human systems become what they study. So, but what we didn't know was the power of wholeness, the experience of being part of the whole. Um, and, you know, the best I can explain it and, and why that brings out the best so easily, because, you know, you would think, you know, committees and groups are, are difficult on their own. So how could a group of 500 people, it sounds impossible, you know, come out with real plans, real concrete shared agreement, real, um, and I think it has to do with perspective and um, it's almost like um, what happens to the astronauts when they see the planet for the first time. There's kind of an instant global consciousness and that happens in these companies. Um, I, in particular, I, to make money to pay for my graduate school, I was a truck driver. So I love those stories of the years we were working with um, um, Roadway Express where they did 65 500 person appreciative inquiry summits in two years to reshape everything, you know, and to bring, but it was just so exciting. It was a tough, conflicted, you know, situation with you know, labor management issues over the years and grievances and teamsters and this and that. But the power of just trusting in the, the goodness of human relationships when we come together to do something real, you know, to co-create as equals. Um, so that's been really exciting. I can, I can share with you so many wonderful examples. So what, what was the outcome? I'm so curious to know yeah. for the organization. Um, well, for, for Roadway, they started using the Appreciative Inquiry Summit for literally every, every kind of change they needed to make, you know? Okay, the, and that's the other thing. These Appreciative Inquiry Summits are very task focused. So one of their summits was to take $75 million of cost out of the annual business and repurpose that into innovation and so on. Well, instead of laying people off, they brought everybody together and said, let's design, let's put our imaginations together to do that. So, um, so within three days, they had a plan to take $75 million of cost out, repurpose that, not lay off a single person. Um, other concrete things, like they would do, a, they had three, 300 facilities across the country um, where, you know, the, 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 there's the input and the goods come in and go out. And um, in Akron, they decided to bring everybody together to redesign the throughput, the dock layouts, everything. And again, they increased throughput by about five, five times the better throughput. And that one innovation spread to 300 um, facilities accounted for like one quarter a $75 million increase in, um, in, in efficiency and margin improvement. So um, that's the other thing I do like to say is that, and, and that's on the you know, hard business side, on the human side, the engagement scores, the lowering of turnover, that kind of thing. Um, it became, you know, and it was featured in, you know, um, Forbes magazine and other places. And I like it because, you know, I, I used to drive trucks <laughs> and in college and not once was I ever brought into a strategic, the inner circle of strategy as a truck driver. You just, you know, I was a laborer, the others were the thinkers. And so um, this whole idea of, of um, treating everybody as fundamentally, you know, in the fundamentals of the business. Other examples, um, you know, that I just, that I just love, like Green Mountain Coffee Roasters. Um, this was a small company at the time we started working with them. Bob Stiller was ahead of his time and wanted to really um, deal with and start um, inventing the sustainable value approach to um, the work that's become so common today but he was ahead of his time. Um, he was amazing um, in so many different ways, had meditation centers. This was a while back and, um, and really believed in the human element. And he said, David, I'd like to do an Appreciative Inquiry Summit as our way of planning every year. Um, and at that time, there were whispers of bankruptcy going on. 
Um, they, they were relatively small, about 150 million in sales at that time. But he would bring the whole system together, you know, coffee growers from Costa Rica, um, every level in his, you know, the warehouse and the truck drivers and the, you know, manufacturing facilities and, um, you know, the information technology and the, you know, finance people, everybody in the system, customers, primary customers and B2B customers, and they were electric. And Bob, you know, would open it, but he would listen to everybody for three days. And at the end of the three days of planning, um, he would reflect back everything he heard because he was very quiet until the very end. And he'd say, I want to thank you all now for empowering me to move with all of these priorities that you've developed. Um, it was almost like an inversion of the hierarchy. The authority was in the group. Anyway, um, 10 years later, um, this small company, um, you know, that was 150 million in sales at that time, 10 years later, their market value was 10 billion or, or $24 billion. Um, they, they, their first summit that they did was prophetic. They called it um, preparing for an era of phenomenal growth. This was at a time where there were whispers of bankruptcy preparing for an era of phenomenal growth and phenomenal world impact. And that's when um, they almost single-handedly created the US fair trade movement out of the visions and meetings that they had there. They became the most ethical company in the world two years running by Ethisphere. That had never happened to a company two years running. Um, it was just remarkable. And um, you know, I, I just look back on those moments when at the end of the sessions, they would just surround Bob and standing ovations because mm. of the way he would listen to his people. Yeah, that's interesting. I was uh, I consulted on their early mindfulness programs and how oh, did they yeah. teach the wow. people? Wow. Uh, how did they teach the guys? They couldn't go teach a class because people yeah. needed to be on the line. So yeah. how did they yeah. incorporate their mindfulness practices yeah. on the line? Right, right, right. right. Yeah, it's quite yeah. an amazing. Bob, and, and people spoofed that in some ways. Bob was on the cover of, um, I think it was Forbes. He was Entrepreneur of the Year. And they had him sitting on coffee bags and beans, you know, in a, in a meditation <laughs> pose. It was kind of a spoof, but he just believed in human excellence and human consciousness and the power of our words, our thoughts, our actions, uh, but in particular, the power of what it would mean to bring out the best in each other. There's so many things I want to say right now. There, uh, at the Drucker School, my, my colleague and I have a phrase of the problems that logic can't solve. Okay. And and it's and you kind of described it that it's it's not about using logic it's about raising energy and and raising energy to be able to see different possibilities that that we yeah. can't see right now yeah. yeah and you're talking about doing that at a collective level yeah right? yeah 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 and it's and it's so exciting and the other part for me is is that you know in this world of of just pandemic change and global change and constant, you know, this volatile, uncertain, everything world that we're in. Um, what I'm noticing is the leader's question, you know, obviously it's all about change, change this, change this, change that, change everything. Um, but the leadership question has recently shifted. It's no longer a question about change per se. It's the question of change at the scale of the whole. How do we move together a whole 67,000 telecommunications company together? How do we move the whole economic region, in depressed North and Midwest town like Cleveland? How do we move but move together? Um, and that's, it's that, it, that's the key question today. And that's where my passion is. And so with the Appreciative Inquiry Summit, method, you know, I'm, I'm just finding that we can move into the most complex of situations, um, but it has to be done together. So like when Apple decides to deal with the supply chains around the world and more, move towards more fully human organization, 
you know, um, you, you, how powerful it is to be able to bring, you know, people from every level, from all around the world to, dis to discover and design the organization of the future that's going to be more fully human. Or, you know, um, the head of the United States Navy called Admiral Clark, who said, can we really change the way the Navy does its strategic planning, the chief naval officer? And um, we shared with him the roadway um, example. And he said, you really think I could bring 500 people together, E5 sailors sitting next to three star admirals and, um, and design and, and co-create the strategic priorities for the future of the Navy and how we operate. And we said, yes. And so it was just so exciting to see that in this command and control kind of system. But again, the energy that you're talking about, you know, I'll often in our courses show these film clips um, and people as, you know, like a young E5 sailor was saying, I couldn't believe that I was invited into the inner circle of strategy. I read the letter that Admiral Clark sent me. Admiral Clark said, I need your heart. I need your mind. I need your brains in the inner circle of strategy work. He said, the young guy said, I, 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 I thought he sent, I, I thought the Admiral, or I thought Admiral Clark sent it to the wrong person. That just doesn't <laughs> happen. Um, but it is, and, and so in each of these, it's incredible. Um, one of one, the ones that just raised my hope about it, what we're capable of was when um, Kofi Annan called in his office. Um, he was preparing for the largest meeting in history between CEOs um, uh, all over the world. Um, and, and it had never happened like this. It was the largest meeting of its kind between CEOs and the United Nations. He, someone said, you should use appreciative inquiry um, for that session. We had a great team from Case Western. And, um, the students that came, it was life changing for all of them. Um, and that's when I got my feet really wet in, in, in this in, um, trends turning into tra trajectories around business as a force for peace in the world, business as a force for good, for eradication of extreme poverty and so on. Um, but again, this was so foreign to the way world summits happen at the United Nations, you know. Um, they're always talking heads and pre-negotiated agreements and panels and experts and so on. Um, so to come together this way, um, they, you know, they were kind of surprised, David, how's this gonna work? And, you know, we've got, you know, Ratan Tata, the head of Tata Industries, and He'll be sitting next to you know, the head of Novo Nordisk and so on. And we'll be at these tables. How are we going to start? And I said, well, Kofi Annan will share a little intro and invite people to design and create the strategy for the growth of the United Nations Global Compact. And then we'll just turn to our partner and we'll do appreciative interviews, <laughs> searching for the high point moments in people's lives and careers, searching for the breakthrough innovations that can inform our imagination of what's possible. And um, so it was very exciting. And um, today, uh, at that time, there were about a thousand companies part of that effort. Today, there's 14,000 corporations um, um, dedicating themselves to, you know, Kofi Annan's words were very powerful when at the early stage of that, he said, and it just appealed to the senior, senior business leaders there. He said, let us choose today to unite the strengths of markets with the power of universal ideals. And let us choose to reconcile the forces of private entrepreneurship with the needs of billions who are living on still less than $2 a day. Let us choose. So um, I got more than I bargained for in that summit. Um, you know, their growth rates went up 400% a year the next two, two years or so. Um, but I, I just started seeing that um, this, this, um, this idea of, of the, you know, the next episode in capitalism, the next episode in business and society relationship, I could just see it unfolding at that moment. So what was the outcome? You talked a little bit about the process, but, and that, yeah. and that obviously it was successful because it kept people, more people wanted to do it. Yeah. Right? What, yeah. Were, what were the outcomes? Then? Okay. So the outcomes in a summit are 
often the creation of you know major initiatives and people align around those initiatives um and so they they, they gave birth to like one of them was called principles for responsible investment and it was all these investment companies and banks and so on that were going to start aligning their investment strategies um, along the lines of the millennium development goals and the world's needs and you know there's now trillions and trillions in investment monies um, you know, um, being treated through the lens now, through the lens of the sustainable development goals and prioritizing efforts and investments and in areas and opportunities to invest in gender equality and eradicating poverty and bringing health to all and so on. So that's just one example. Um, let, let me give you another example, like in um, Cleveland with Mayor Jackson. Uh, Mayor Jackson actually went to the United Nations Global Compact meeting and saw that this trend towards a world of green and sustainable and um, regenerative, um, that this was no longer a trend, it was a full-blown trajectory. And he realized that, you know, in Cleveland that was suffering from job loss and so on, that this could create many jobs. And so he said, David, can we do an appreciative inquiry summit um, for Cleveland in the Northeast Ohio economic region? And, um, and it was great. The title of the summit um, was one of the best. It was called Coming Together, um, well, Coming Together to Create an Economic Engine to Empower a Green City on a Blue Lake. And those words attracted everybody in the city. It attracted the big banks. It attracted the, um, the grassroots and community activists. It attracted, so we soon had over 700 people in um, the convention hall and Mayor Jackson opens it up and then we go into the appreciative inquiry um, 4D cycle, discovery, dream, design, about a day on each of those Ds, discovery, dream, design, and destiny. And um, so exciting um, to see the, you know, kind of almost like a new kind of democracy, not our gridlocked kind of dialogical democracy where we're, you know, trying to cancel out the voice of the other, but it was more like a design democracy. It, 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 in this, it, it turns into um, the summit room after you go through and lift up all the strengths and assets in the system. Then you move to put yourself 10 years into the future to the common and collective dream. Then you move into design studios. You know, in the dream phase, you start hearing, oh, you know, we could take the vacant land and turn that into green gardens and urban farms. Oh, we, we, have, we, we see the, you know, the potential of growing jobs through becoming a leader in freshwater wind energy. So in a summit, then you find those like 20 opportunity areas and turn it in the big hall into 20 different design studios where people vote with their feet in that phase and, and, be, and go to work on it. And the reason I'm sharing this is because you're asking about results. That's one of the things I'm most proud about, about the Appreciative Inquiry Summit. People are tired of coming together and say, oh, we had a great dialogue. You know, we had a great conversation, but tired of doing that. And then it's over and it was just an event and we just scratched the surface in terms of our relationships. And so I almost want a bumper sticker today because so often our approaches to focus groups and let's just help people participate and get their voice. Um, so often it, it's not real. It's, it's pseudo participation. You know, oh, we, we, we did surveys with all the residents and so on. No, um, here we're coming together to co-design co and just example of how it perpetuates. Um, one of the groups that was formed in the design phase was the, around the question, how might we become the first freshwater offshore wind energy system? you know, referring to Lake Erie, because mm -hmm. all the wind energy um, that's in the water, it's in oceans, and there's huge engineering challenges to, you know, um, um, freshwater and ice and so on. But um, they 
work together. They created an image. They actually prototyped it. They built a model of what it's going to look like. We move into a prototyping phase. We don't want just action plans and words on a piece of paper. And as they're presenting this model that in front of the assembly, people could taste it. They could see it. They could you know, join in. That's what rapid prototyping invites. And um, anyway, that group went out and formed a corporation, a nonprofit corporation to guide this effort. Um, they raised their first $5 million. Um, again, not without the, not relying on anybody, but self-organizing. Um, they um, raised the $5 million, went into planning and designing and, and then, um, Last year, they um, or two years ago, they got $56 million to set it in motion. So in that first summit, we came out with 25 working groups, okay? The mayor was so amazed at the collaboration and the trust and the goodness and goodwill that he saw that he, he got up at the end and said, you know, this is, I didn't even talk to my chief of staff, but we're gonna do this every year for the next 10 years. This is a big project. It's gonna require this kind of community engagement over the years. And now it's into its 12th year. So that's the other part of the appreciative inquiry. I think because of the design studio phase where people um, get so invested, internally committed um, that they it becomes totally self-organizing. Um, so, I often ask people, you know, in your experience of change efforts that get exhausted and don't last long, you know, um, I, I, you know, like with this first one that we had, we had 25 working groups. How many do you think actually came back? They're all volunteer, voluntary. This wasn't a single corporation. How many of those working groups do you think, based on your experience, um, still remained intact and came to the next year's summit? And people will say, well, maybe 14 of them, maybe 10 of them, um, maybe, you know, a drop off of half or more. Um, but I said, no, it's all wrong. What happened was instead of 25 working groups, 32 showed up. They actually grew the working groups over that year. So that's what one of the things that I think is most powerful about this is it's the design phase. It's design democracy phase. And it's all on the power of human energy, and uh, which is which is at some level limitless, right? It's and, limitless. It's and limitless. You create something that wasn't there before. Right, right. And as they're preparing and sharing their prototypes, the auditorium is just erupting in cheers. People, you know, are 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 seeing that we're going beyond words on a piece of paper. We need to know more about what's happening in that kind of phase in the Appreciative Inquiry Summit because, um, you know, like look at our fractured world right now where we've lost our belief in coming together across political boundaries, across religious boundaries. You know, we we've our our belief in better together has been shattered in so many ways, especially in the politics and the extremism and so on. And, and I have been thinking about it, like in America, when has the best in our relational abilities come happened in, in our history? And I think um, it, it, you know, like one of the times was in the early settlers days and pioneering days, it's when everybody would come together in the community and build their neighbor's barn. You know, they would bring the hammer, the nails, wood, whatever they had, and they would give to each other and build something. They wouldn't just come together and talk about something. Interesting. They would build something. And so I think, um, I think we need to have an imagination right now, a next stage in democracy. Um, so, so many of our political scientists cannot even begin to write about a next better stage of democracy. Um, but I think this design studio democracy, think of the energy in an Apple design studio. Think of the energy at IDEO design studios where they're doing brainstormers and rapid prototyping a hundred times a week in groups and so on. It becomes a muscle. Um, and uh, just a, a last comment on that. Um, 
I, I, the, the need to think about this as a new stage in democracy. I asked President Carter after he retired, um, I used, was doing an appreciative inquiry and I asked a question that we often do. President Carter, you know, throughout your career, you have, as a leader, um, you've had high points, you've had low points, you've had peaks, you've had valleys. Um, I'd like you to think about and single out the high point moment in your career in leadership as a leader. And he said instantly, that's so easy. He said it was after, it was post-presidency and as after, after, um, um, you know, I, it was post-presidency and we were building our first Habitat for Humanity home. And he said, I'll never forget the moment. I was in tears when we built the first home. We're standing in a circle and we're, we're sharing, you know, um, just our sense of the generosity that we saw. But I'm looking in the eyes of everybody. We've crossed every class boundary in our society. We've crossed every racial boundary in our society. And, but most important, you could see the visible evidence of our collaboration together. It was a tangible yeah. result. The tangible result. It's in the creating that we, that trust flows and community expands. There's so many things there, right? Like one of my principles is attention needs somewhere good to go. And, and that you move toward what is enlivening, you know, mm -hmm. and that, 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 that enlivens. And so this whole orientation around away from problem to what's enlivening, right, yeah. shifts the energy equation. You know, I, you know, I think we've talked about this before, but you know, I was yeah. at the Cleveland Clinic diagnosed with this supposedly terminal illness and told right. me I had five years to live. And, yeah. Yeah. and the prognosis was 10%, you know, 90% mortality. And for whatever reason, you know, I, I focused on being on the 10%. Mm -hmm. And, and then also investing the energy of my life, however long it was going to be in what did I find interesting? What was enlivening? What was engaging to me yeah. without thinking about how was it going to turn into an income or a career or anything like that? And, and, right. you know, one thing led to another <laughs> and, yeah. you know, I'm yeah. still here. And yeah. so this process of focusing attention on what works or what, what, what creates energy, you know, because yeah. rationality, rationally, we have all the data. Okay. 90% of people aren't going to make it. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that's why this phrase that the problems that rationality can't solve because rationality mm -hmm. will box you in a certain way of seeing reality. Yeah. Uh, whereas, you know, what you're pointing to just takes the box away. Yeah. 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 And the, the power of the questions, I think, um, and good for you in terms of, you know, um, your instinct and your search for what gives life in your life. And it's a core question I think we should all ask. We should all ask, right? What do you think a business education of the 21st century is about? Like if you had to reimagine a business education, what would you teach a young leader? Yeah. You know, there's yeah. the, obviously the, the things we all have to know, like finance and economic, you know, economic, economics and all mm -hmm. that. And then what's beyond that yeah. in, in a world yeah. of, you know, in a way that's kind of ongoing crisis in some way. Like what does a, what does a person need to be able to do? Yeah. 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 Well, it's a great question because, you know, I don't know if you, if you were aware of it, but the number one major undergraduate, graduate, and postgraduate in the world is business, um, and you know, going to management schools and so on. Um, that was interesting. Um, in one of the conversations that I was hoping to facilitate again with Dalai Lama, but it was Dalai Lama with some of the top business leaders in the world, Bill George, the head of Medtronics, and. Um, and just an incredible conversation around ethics for the 21st century. Um, and um, towards the end of that conversation, I did, I shared with Dalai Lama, I said, you know, over a million students a year coming out of our business schools, that adds up to the billions of decisions that we make every day. And I said, um, 
if anything imaginable were possible and there were no constraints whatsoever, what would the nature of a management school's education be? <laughs> and he started giggling and he started laughing. He scratched his head and he said, management? He goes, I can't manage a thing. <laughs> he said, if I didn't have a lot of people to help me, I couldn't manage a thing. And, you know, he, here he is talking to the business leaders and he was kind of like saying disarming, you know. Um, but then he went into this incredible discourse about um, the need for a fundamental reorientation from preoccupation of the self to, um, to a concern for all of life and the other and our fundamental interdependence. And I think that's what we, we need to, we need in our business schools. I think we need deep education that helps us um, begin to experience the fundamental interconnectedness of every thought, every word, every you know action and interaction. Um, I, I think that you know stuff like the word social responsibility and so on. Don't get at it. Um, I think we need an ethic of, of a con that emerges from a consciousness of connectedness, a spiritual sense of, um, of oneness. And, um, <laughs> and, it, and, it's, and, it's, and some of our language isn't the right language. I think um, I was in a meeting of CEOs in Brazil and you know, with the World Business Academy and the World Business Academy has a phrase that business is, you know, any group that's that powerful has to take responsibility um, for the world and that power. And, and then one of the CEOs surprised me and he said, I think the word responsibility is not the right word. He said, it's not responsibility for the whole, it's intimacy with the whole. Um, and this Brazilian CEO, Rodrigo Lores, you know, I think Brazil has this special relational consciousness, a capacity of, you know, of a reverence for family and relationship and unity and, um, and, the, and relational um, co-creation and so on. But I thought that changes everything. If we have a sense of the intimacy of the whole, um, then it's like our family, you know? You're not gonna want to pollute your daughter's life. You're not gonna want to, you know, um, so I think it's that intimacy and connection with life. It's interesting because the last podcast episode is one of my students, Heather Dyer, who is uh, an endangered species biologist. Yeah. And, you know, she started to use the lens of biology and relationship as an overlay for her own leadership activity and yeah. to see that we're all, we're all related. And how do we start to take care of that? Right? It's, it's exactly what you're speaking to. In some it, and it's spontaneous then. It's, it's, it's part, you know, again, it's the intimacy feeling uh, with the whole and recognition that that intimacy is real. And you know? every thought, every word, every utterance that we make has a reverberation. And um, so I like that a lot. And it, I think it relates to your notion of, are we aware of how contagious we are? You know, um, there was an interesting study um, around, um, about positive emotions in human systems and the energy and um, Wayne Baker at the University of Michigan was a sociologist and, and he had taken the tried and true research methods of, you know, of um, mapping the networks in a system and, the sociometric kind of analysis. And of course, um, all of that, those studies showed that leadership is defined not by hierarchy, but um, by relationships. You know, like if you go in and you draw lines, you have a department draw lines, everybody draws a chart of who they interrelate with most day. And it becomes like a diagram, a network diagram. You feed that into a computer system, network analysis. and Lo and behold, what you find is the actual leaders are those with the most connected tissues to the information flows. More people connect to you than that person and so on. So that's tried and true, that, that predicts leadership. 
what Wayne Baker did was take that tried and true research method a step further and had people again draw the connections and who they connect with most in the workplace every day and and then fed it into a program that does the network analysis. But he asked an, another question with each line. To what extent is, is your energy elevated by being around that person? To what extent is your energy elevated by being around that person? So people would draw a line for me or for you or whatever. And on a scale from one to seven, to what extent is your energy elevated? Zero, one is very little and seven is quite a bit. Well, what he found was that that predicts, that question and that network predicts leadership five times more powerfully than um, just being at the heart of the information flow. Not just the information, it's the quality of the interaction. The quality. To what extent is your energy elevated by being around that person? And think about that, about what people would say as they drew the chart with you, you know? I mean, it's that kind of awareness that I think you're trying to bring to leadership that I think is so important. You know, what were the vibrations and the feelings that were left in the wake of that meeting that I was just part of? I call that, how do you transform the invisible office? The invisible office, that's fantastic. Right? Yeah. And like, yeah. Which is, you know, the beliefs and f feelings and, uh, you know, it's energy, yeah. right? Basically. Yeah. And we're not and talking then, about like and, yeah, cosmic and, Southern California energy. It's like the energy of uh, connection. And it's, and it's not just retrospective, me thinking what were the ripple effects of my emotional dynamics and self and centeredness and so on, but it's ahead of time. What are the kinds of feelings that people are likely going to be feeling from me in this meeting? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Speaking of meeting, you have the, the great leadership reset coming next month huh? at Case, you know, hosted by Case, right? As part of yeah. the uh, Global Forum for Business as Asian of World Benefit. Yeah. Would yeah. you speak to that? Yeah, yeah, it's really exciting. It's um, we. It's the fifth global forum for business as an agent of world benefit. It's a question. It's mm -hmm. not an assertion. What does it look like? Where is it happening? Um, what What is the future? And what we're seeing here is just um, a, a whole tipping point emerging. Um, and so we partnered with Barrett Kohler Publishers um, this time because they're very good at doing these kinds of summits digitally online. Um, and, um, and they really care about leadership to create a world that works for all. And so we found a nice um, relationship and partnership with them. Um, typically in our um, global forums, you know, held at Case Western Reserve, we have about a thousand people come and it's very exciting. And, it's kind of like a, we'd like to call it an institute tomorrow to really look at, like Wayne Gretzky said, I never play the puck where it is. I always play it where it's going to be. Um, so we've carried that energy into this, but um, um, Barrett Kohler's track record is amazing. And their last um, couple summits, they've encouraged and brought together um, 25,000 in one of the summits and 30,000 in another. So um we have 44 incredible um speakers that are joining us some of the greatest ceos in the world today some of the greatest thought leaders in the field of leadership um, the title of this year summit is the great leadership reset moment and so paul pullman for example the ceo former ceo of unilever um, i think he's one of the most important leaders on the planet today, um, his, his model and the way they've adopted all 17 of the sustainable development goals and how under his leadership, um, by doing good out there and to shaping their strategies around, you know, not a, not, not kind of a sideline to the business, but um, that these goals could become the strategic launch points for radical innovation. So the kinds of things they've done in terms of gender equality and helping people eradicate poverty and empower people's opportunities and so on. Um, under his leadership, 
um, um, Unilever's market cap grew, um, you know, from, you know, you know, grew about 300%. So over, you know, I think it, when he was done, it was about 300 billion or something. But um, it's amazing stories. He's now the chair of our honorary chair of the International Chamber of Commerce. He's vice chair of the um, United Nations Global Compact. He's got a new book coming out called Net Positive, he and Andrew Winston. So that's an example. Um, uh, you know, others like um, Jesper Broden, the CEO of IKEA, um, like Roberto Marquez, the CEO of Natura, uh, like Jody Berg, the CEO of Vitamix. And then, of course, we have just amazing thought leaders like yourself, um, like Raj Sisodia, um, the, one of the founders of Conscious Capitalism, and the list goes on. So um, we're really excited. It's probably the most powerful event that we've pulled together. And we're on a mission. You know, we feel like this is, you know, you know, this, you know, everybody, you know, knows the kind of world that we've been living in, you know, start of the 2020s started like, you know, like, like a seismograph pointing to earthquakes and what's going to happen in the future. We had, you know, wildfires and mega floods. We had global pandemic. We had George Floyd and the cries for racial justice. We had um, attacks on our democracy and you know the um, breakdown in, in terms of human conversations. But we're lifting up these stories of companies that are moving way beyond the typical sustainability agenda. And one of the exciting things that we're studying is how by doing good out there, what happens to the in here of the company and um, we call it mirror flourishing, um, that while it looks like we're doing good out there, guess where the flourishing is really happening? It's happening on the inside. So we invite people, um, it's free. We were able to, we were gifted with some amazing um, grants from the Halloran Foundation and the University of St. Thomas. So it's totally free. and. Um, and I think um, people can go to, it's called, um, you know, go to the um, great, the great leadership reset.com. And, um, and it's free to register. And I think registration opens today. Today, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So that's good. And it's about seeing where the future already is happening in some of these hyper leading edge companies that are meeting the challenge of climate change and deploying responses to that in a in a growth oriented way. That's right. That's right. That's right. And it and it is definitely um, the future. It's it's it, it create it, it elevates and creates so much creativity. I also think that um, as a planet, we are moving into um, a shared mission. Um, very rapidly, more rapidly. I mean, we've been sleepwalking for four decades around a lot of these things, but now um, the, the tipping point is happening. And uh, Mariana Mazacuto, one of the world's great new economists, young economists, um, she did studies of, um, of market economies that um, in nations where they took on a collective mission um, and that mission could be to, you know, transform all of Germany into 100% renewable energy or whatever. But where it's an all-in kind of mission, um, the classic um, example in her work is John F. Kennedy's, you know, um, we are going to put a person on the moon and return them safely to Earth, not because it's easy, but precisely because it's difficult and it's going to draw out her most powerful collective energies. And sure enough, in her studies, when there, those mission economy moments happen, the dynamism of the economy is um, at its highest, you know, and there's all kinds of, you know, spinoffs like the internet was born and x-rays were born during them. And I think we are, um, when she talks about this, we are um, moving in towards a, the first kind of universal 
um, um, shared task with the Paris agreements and 193 countries coming together around the sustainable development goals, hundreds and thousands of corporations moving in the direction of a Unilever. Um, we might be moving into this, you know, a, a, a mission economy as a whole human family. And that's never happened before at this level. I mean, we've come together before, like, around the Marshall Plan or the global eradication of smallpox, but those pale in significance to this um, next couple decades of coming together um, that we are about to see. So it's gonna be exciting. And that the, 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 the summit has the potential of kind of pushing that ball down a different direction, right? In, in yeah. a good direction. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and we have a new book coming out with the summit um, mm -hmm. that um, was again supported um, through the research, and it's called "The Business of Building a Better World." Um, um, the yeah, and so you know, there's going to be a lot of chapters given away, and a lot of the um, speakers and authors have given things that they'll. So it's it's great for learning, I think, um, and like you said, our business schools. It'll be great to bring all of that material into the gen next generation leadership. Yeah, I mean, as I said, this conversation could go on and on, but you know, what I take away from it is that when you bring t people together, focusing on what can be created, right? Um, you can unleash kinds of energy, and that's what makes this process so fascinating to me because it's mm -hmm. it's not one that we naturally default to as a culture, right? That, that we, um, you can focus on creation, right? That we've, we've lived through decades of deconstruction, mm -hmm. which, you know, there are reasons for that. But now I think we're, we're at a tipping point of reconstruction. Like what, what do we want to create, yeah. right? Rather than what do we want to destroy or cancel? What, what kind of world do you want to create? Yeah, yeah. And how do we do that? Well, and, it, and, it's, and it's calling for our best, and, and this is where the sweet spot is happening. Um, and it, you know, the business for good. This is the era when the business for good is good business. So you've got young companies like nothing new. Um, you should look them up. Um, the young people love them. They create gym shoes that are really beautiful, um, but. There's literally nothing new on any part of the gym shoe. Um, that they're made out of plastics that, that are recovered from our oceans and um, fish nets and so on. And when you are done with these um, shoes, you send them back and they give you in return $20 for sending them back. And so that's an example of the innovation that's happening. We're moving towards a recognition, not just of economies of scale, but economies of circularity, you know, guess how many times that same material can be used over and over again. So it makes tremendous business sense. The young people love it. Um, we've got, you know, other, other um, companies like um, um, one's called Solar Foods, where they are making food and protein 20,000 times more efficient than doing it through agriculture. It's breakthrough work. Um, and, and, you know, they set out to ask themselves the question, you know, how do we decouple agriculture from protein? And they're pulling it out of thin air. You've got Toyota creating net positive cities now um, at the base of Mount Fuji. It's called um, Deeply Woven City, where they're producing enough renewable energy to give back to the surrounding communities where um, with the um, new technologies of personalizing medicine and the DNA kinds of things. So bringing completely personalized medicine to everybody. Um, you've got companies, you know, like Interface and Kingfisher and um, Ikea um, saying, you know, um, working towards net zero is one thing, you know, reduce waste, reduce all of this. But now the, it's the age of net positive. How do we create more net positive plus? Is the, our, is the world better off because our company has been part of it? Um, these stories are exciting because it's, it's, it's a calling forth of radical imagination and innovation. And young people are loving it. 
So you think of Tesla, for example, their market cap is more than the six other major automobile companies combined, you know, even though they produce um, a, a sliver of the moat, but their, their purpose. And I was in Amsterdam talking to one of the Tesla display centers and, and the young people in there were just so alive and passionate for their work. And, and in the display center in Amsterdam, I said, um, can you tell me what is your job here? What is it that you do? <laughs> and he said, my job is to electrify the renewable energy age. And I said, no, but what's, what do you do on the display center? And he said, my job is to electrify the renewable energy age. I said, but what do you tell your mother <laughs> when you come home from work, what you did that day? He said, I took part in helping to electrify the renewable energy age. So that's what we're seeing in these companies. They're coming to life with the kind of energy that you're talking about. Because it's their world they're going to inherit and they want to be a part in creating something good from that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's beautiful. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, please subscribe to the podcast. Give us a review and tell us your thoughts. The best thing you can do is share this with someone who would find it interesting and helpful. If you have an idea for other topics you'd like to explore, please let us know. Contact me at info at jeremyhunter.net. Thank you to the multi-talented Mr. Jason Beck for making the magic happen behind the scenes. And our music is the creation of Jeffrey with a G Munger. You can learn more about his work at kettleblackmusic.com.